Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, in a recent article published in the Journal of Medical Case Reports, the author re authors report an unusual case of a girl diagnosed with Neisseria gonorrhea after bathing in a heavily frequented hot pool at the edge of the crater lake Specchio de Verne, hopefully I said that right, otherwise known as the Mirror of Venus, on Pantelleria Island, Italy. Now, joining me today to discuss the case is Professor Felicity Goodyear-Smith. Dr. Goodyear-Smith is with the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care with the University of Auckland, and she is the co-author of the case report. Dr. Goodyear-Smith, welcome to the show, ma'am. Thank you, Robert. Hey, so before we get into the case, um, can you just give the audience a short primer on Neisseria gonorrhea? Yes, well, Neisseria gonorrhea is a bacterium, um, and it's been around forever and ever. And it's mostly, of course, um, sexually transmitted. So, um, it, you know, it, it gives it gives the um, uh, the sexually transmitted infection called gonorrhea um, uh, from the organism called the gonococcus, uh, otherwise called the clap, and it's uh, been around a long, long time. Um, not a serious quite so much these days as it used to be uh, before we had the advent of um, antibiotics. Now, this is an unusual case for sure. I'm sure you wouldn't even deny that. Um, now, this is an adolescent female who tested positive for gonorrhea after swimming in the hot pool. Uh, Dr. Goodyear-Smith, is there a precedent for accidental non-sexual transmission of gonorrhea? Oh, there certainly is, but actually there's two two things there that are slightly um, uh, different from what you said. First of all, she's not adolescent. She's pre-adolescent. She's pre-pubertal. That makes a really big difference. Mm -hmm. And also, she didn't swim. She was lying in very shallow water bathing. And those two things um, uh, uh, contributed a lot to the, the, the fact that she got this infection. But there's actually a huge precedent for this. Um, and in the, the 19th century, in children's homes, particularly in the United States, but also elsewhere, in orphanages and hospitals, um, this infection was rife amongst little girls, and it was not sexually transmitted. Now, um, th th there would be cases of children who had acquired it sexually, who came into the hospital or the orphanage, but once they were there, the, the organism spread like mad. It was really difficult to control. Um, and it spread through all sorts of things like um, nurses uh, going from one to the other, touching them, changing their nappies, um, using rectal thermometers, um, uh, washing them, and also in some places in communal baths where lots of children were, uh, you know, were uh, bathed together. And hospitals recorded how they got rid of these outbreaks. And, and what they did was they isolated um, the children in terms of um, uh, they might their diapers might be made of a cloth that they would burn. So each one would get burnt and they wouldn't get reused. The nurses had to wear gloves and, and, um, and not transmit it from one child to another. Um, and there were a whole lot of uh, things put in place to actually stop this, this problem. Some hospitals would not admit little girls if they had vaginal infections because they knew it would spread. Mm. Uh, this was a huge body of literature that was published in, in, in reputable medical journals. But of course, once we got antibiotics, it all went, um, uh, you know, it, it settled down. And so this was a sort of body of literature that got lost to, 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 to com co common knowledge. And, um, uh, and, and the fact that it's, it's really mostly only um, pre-pubertal girls that get this, and there's a reason for that, um, in that um, uh, little girls um, don't have um, as much estrogen in their bodies, and their vaginal areas and the, the vaginal lips are very susceptible to this infection. But once you reach puberty, then the, um, the, the estrogen has an effect that actually makes uh, uh, gonorrhea are not able to grow in those tissues. So they can't grow in the vagina anymore. They can't grow on the on the, the linings of the vaginal lips. You only get an infection inside in the cervix and in the, uh, and in the uterus. And so 
um, it, it's transmitted sexually in adult women uh, almost exclusively because um, they're not going to get the vaginal infection. And that's why it's really important that this was a little, you know, this girl was prepubertal and she didn't have those estrogen levels that, that, that are protective in getting this infection. Oh, very fascinating. Um, Dr. Goodyear-Smith, to give us a the audience a better picture of the location, can you go ahead and describe the mirror of Venus? I'm going to go ahead and put a picture up so the audience can take a look at it. This is from your uh, paper. Um, what do we know about this? Uh, well, well, it's it's a, a crater lake. It's a beautiful, deep lake uh, that you can swim in. But on one side of it, um, where you can sort of see in the picture, there's some hot springs just on the edge of it. And people have built these little rocky um, uh, pools uh, so that the hot water gets trapped before it goes into the cold lake. And people can therefore lie in this hot water and bathe. Um, and it's it's a, depending on where you are in the little pool, but um, it's usually about 30, 38 degrees, um, you know, sort of just a little bit more than, um, than blood temperature. Uh, and it is... Um, it just happens to be um, a very, very good environment for gonorrhea to grow. It's just, um, it just meets all the requirements for this particular bug. But they're very shallow, these pools. Um, and then the water slowly trickles from the hot spring um, you know, th through the pool and then through the little holes in, the, um, in that stony wall that you can see out into the lake. So it's slowly, slowly, slowly being, being flushed. But the water is sort of semi-stagnant. Okay. Now, is the Mirror of Venus, uh, is this a tourist location? Oh, absolutely, yes. And it's a beautiful lake. I mean, I've never been there, but um, uh, I, from what I've seen, it's a very beautiful lake. And, and tourists go there. And one of the things tourists do is that they go and, uh, having swum in the lake itself, they go and actually bathe in these in, in these handmade, you know, these uh, man-made hot, po hot pools where you just soak. It's only about 20 centimetres deep, so you're just lying there soaking. You're not actually swimming. Yeah, and what I found so fascinating about this is, I mean, Neisseria gonorrhea is uh, a very labile organism. It's, it's you know, incredibly fastidious and all that, that this was an acceptable environment for the bacterium to remain viable. Yeah, but when you, we know from in, from in vivo, in, in, um, uh, in in vitro studies, where, where you actually studied in the lab that it actually um, grows really, really well um, between 25 and 39 degrees Celsius. Now, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, just, uh, you know, sort of blood temperature. Um, and um, it's very vulnerable to drying, but of course, it's not going to dry out in a hot pool. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it likes an isotonic environment, which this pool is. Um, and it likes um, uh, to have some carbon dioxide. Um, uh, and this pool had about between, there's some studies that have been done on the water in these pools. And it's mm -hmm. between 5 and 7% carbon dioxide, which is actually oh. really, really yeah. nice for it. So everything about this pool is, is sort of suitable as, as, as a medium to grow. Now, when we grow gonorrhea all the time in labs, I mean, that's how you identify it. You right. put it on an agar plate and you grow it. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it also doesn't like um, uh, a very, you know, acid environment. So it's the pH is right in this water as well. And there's some biomass. There's just sort of bits of material floating in this water, which also helps that culture. So um, there's been, you know, there's been a lot of studies actually um, uh, looking at gonorrhea um, growing in various mediums over the years and then seeing if you can contaminate articles and detect it. And, and there's a lot of cases where you can, where you can actually, if you get it on a towel or some other sort of cloth and you get, as long as you get a globule of it and it doesn't, um, it doesn't dry out, then you can actually um, swab that and grow it. So mm. it is fastidious, you're right, but there's certain, there's certain conditions which it actually will grow quite happily. Okay. Fascinating. Again, fascinating. Um, Dr. Goodyear-Smith, can you, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the case itself. And and if you don't mind taking as much time as you like and talk about the case and how you came to the conclusion that it was a non-sexual transmission, if you don't mind. 
straw. And so this this was a ten year old girl and her seven year old sister and their parents from Austria who went to um, the island and were having a holiday. Um, and um, uh, for, for, for about two weeks, I think. And then um, during that time, they swam. They bathed, They swam in the in the lake, and then they bathed in these pools. And about two days later, um, the older girl um, got. Uh, a sore vagina and it was um, it, it was painful. In fact, she didn't want to swim because it hurt. Um, and so they um, they were obviously away and they got they bought some antifungal cream from the chemist and it uh, it settled down but not completely. Um, and when they went back to um, uh, to home, they she went to her pediatrician and the pediatrician did a swab and discovered that it was gonorrhea. Um, and so they, you know, the, obviously it was, they were astounded. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the first thing was, well, is this, was this sexually transmitted? Now, the girl was absolutely adamant and she's you know, a bright little young girl and said nothing had ever happened to her. Um, they tested the whole family immediately. And so both parents and the other little girl, everybody was negative. Um, and there really wasn't any opportunity uh, that, that for her to have actually got this from a stranger, um, she hadn't been away uh, alone on this trip, away from her family. They'd always been together. Um, there was no evidence that her father had it, and certainly her mother didn't have it. If her father had it, he would have passed it on. And I mean, he was, you know, they were the whole family, you know, adamant that this couldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. But they did recognise that um, that the um, that the pool uh, was a potential um, vector for it. You know that maybe maybe she got it from the pool because they had had to have come from somewhere, um, and so um, I mean you always have to think sexual abuse when when you get this in a young girl, but 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 there are many 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 cases as well. I mean no, there aren't many cases at all. Little girls don't get gone away very often, but when they do, it may be sexual abuse. But there's also lots of recorded cases of this non-sexual transmission from various places. Including baths, but also um, you know other things like um, contaminated towels that are shared between family members where someone's got it. So um, basically, it was um, you know it it just seemed it seemed very very plausible that she could have got it from this pool when we looked when we looked at all the literature in terms of the the nature of the water of the pool, which is published. Um, we could see that it actually fitted beautifully with what gonorrhea likes to grow in and the fact that the water is very shallow. Um, it seemed a much more likely uh, di- you know, a cause of her infection than actually sexual abuse for which there, were, there seemed to be no evidence at all. And so uh, we can't say definitively that's where she got it from, but it does, everything seemed to fit. And so it seemed extremely likely. So, so the fact that she got it and her younger sister or no, nobody else in the area didn't get it, the luck of the draw or bad luck of the draw? Well, well, well there were, the, the, as you saw in that photo, there's several little pools. Uh-huh. And there wasn't much room in them because they were pretty crowded. Apparently, People were coming and going. Mm-hmm. Um, she and her father lay down in one, and the mother and the little girl were in the next one. Oh. So the other sister was not potentially in a contaminated pool. Because it was slight, it would have different flow from another little hot spring on the edge. So, so you wouldn't expect the, the, the other girl to get it unless the same visitor went from pool to pool and contaminated both. But that, that we hypothesized that somebody had somebody who got in the pool had gone rear, that they had a discharge, mm-hmm. and that discharge got into the water. Now, it might have been while she was in there because there were several people coming and going all the time, it might have been a little bit before. But, um, but you know, it wouldn't take long before that water sort of slowly got flushed out. So she was sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time, is yeah. the hypothesis. It's not, it's not something you expect to happen often. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. That, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, so, so she's been treated. She's doing fine. It wasn't antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea. No, it wasn't antibiotic. No, no, she, she was treated um uh, she was she was really askance she'd just gone back to you know to her hometown and she was about to start a new high school or a new school mm. she was terrified that they you know that the, all the kids might find out she had this terrible infection <laughs> but of course no one did and yeah she had she had a the standard treatment and 
she's better. I mean, not, not you know, repeat tests were all gone. Um, so it had no real repercussions, and it didn't it didn't spread beyond the the, the, the vaginal lips and you know and vagina. It didn't it didn't it was it ascended inside her body. So she was um, you know it was just um, you know uh, she got better and she, and she and she's fine. And but we we decided that we thought that this case needed to be um, uh, you know disseminated because. Because every so often, and I'm a forensic physician as well as a GP, as well as, a, you know, a family doctor, um, and I have seen um, or been involved in a number of cases over the years where little girls get gonorrhea and where all the evidence suggests that this has been non-sexually transmitted. But the outcome can be disastrous. Um, that... Um, Immediately, the children, this fortunately didn't happen in this case, the children are taken, you know, they lose their parents, they're taken away from home, they go into foster homes. Um, sometimes um, a parent might be charged uh, or, or, or just that they, the, the kid loses its parents um, because it's assumed that it must be sexual abuse. And a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of the authorities... Uh, in various parts of the world um, will claim that non-sexual uh, transmission is impossible. They have this belief that it's only sexually transmitted. Now, clearly, you want to you, you want to make absolutely sure that there's no chance that it was sexually transmitted. But but there's other cases where the damage, if you if you keep the stance and you don't accept that, okay, in this particular case, all the evidence points towards um uh you know a, a non-trans you know, non-sexual vector um you know they you destroy a family otherwise i mean this this family was lucky and their yeah, pediatrician yeah. believed them um you know and and, it, and the evidence was pretty pretty straightforward really uh but you know um that's not the case in many cases that i've been involved in i've seen children lose their parents forever um uh and um uh, you know, and, and going up in a foster home has terrible repercussions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and I was, th I was thinking about that while you were speaking. Is there, do were, were police authorities in Italy or in Austria, did they get involved at all? No, they didn't. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think there was mandatory reporting in, um, uh, in Austria. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, the, did, the, there was some attempt to tell the authorities uh, the council and the authorities in in on the island, but they weren't. They didn't ever answer. They weren't interested. I mean, obviously, it's it's their major tourist attraction. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and the, the the yes, you could put up signs and say warning, you know, but actually, you know, I it's very. I think it's actually very low risk uh, that this would continue to happen. I mean, this is just sort of like a one off. Um, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, when you do bathe in these sort of pools. It's not only gonorrhea. There's lots of other bugs you can get. If you're if you're bathing in a, a warm, you know, uh, almost stagnant pool um, with lots of other people, um, you know, there's all sorts of possible infections, as I'm probably sure you know with your podcast that, that that you could. So, I mean, my suggestion would be that at least what you do if you bathe in that. And I do. I personally come from a country with lots of hot pools. I love bathing in hot pools. But the sensible thing to do would be to leap in the lake afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a big, there's a whole lot of clear fresh water there. You know, you could just leap in and you know make sure that at least you've got you're going to reduce the chance of contamination. Okay, well, let, let me go ahead and close out with this, um, uh, Professor. What, what's the takeaway message from this case? Ah, uh, takeaway message is whenever you if if you do get young children, especially young girls with gonorrhea, uh, it's really important to not assume it must be sexual abuse. That actually, certainly it's got to be a major consideration, but but you just need to accept that possibly it's non-sexual transmission uh, and that considerable harm can be averted if you actually consider that possibility as well. Right, and I, got, I have it posted right now, and this is the case study. Gonococcus infection probably acquired from bathing in a natural thermal pool, a case report. And this is published 
in the Journal of Medical Case Reports. And I'll put a link to it in the show notes when I publish the podcast. And I want to thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Felicity Goodyear Smith, for sharing this fascinating case report with me and my audience. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.